verses 1 through 6. And our topic today is God alone. God alone. And it reads as this. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. That is the word of God. God alone. God alone. William Barclay, a renowned Bible expositor, once said, the essence of idolatry is the desire to get. A man sets up an idol and worships it because he desires to get something out of that God. He believes that his sacrifices, his gifts, and his worship can persuade or even bribe God to give him whatsoever he desires. St. Augustine said it like this, idolatry is worshiping anything that ought to be used and using anything that ought to be worshipped. Church, keep yourselves from idols. When we view anything, anyone, any place, as providing something for us, in the place of what God says only he could provide, Amen. then we have effectively, either knowingly or unknowingly, made that thing our God. And God said he will have no other God before him. I know that. Only God only the one true and living God is worthy of our worship, all of our love, all of our sacrifice. That belongs to him and him alone. Church, hear me. Keep yourselves from idols. Amen. We keep ourselves from idols by practicing, excuse me, we keep ourselves from practicing idolatry by first acknowledging God and fearing Him. Verses 1 through 3 says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, you shall have no other gods before me. So that is the first of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. God said, he made it plain, he made it clear for the wicked and rebellious children of Israel that he is their God. And not only is he their God, he is their Lord. 
So then God made the point to establish who he was Come on, yes. and who he was to them yes. before he opened up his mouth about what he did for them. Come on, yes. All right. So let me say it again. Come on, baby. Come on. God talked about, God established who he was. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Before he said one thing about what he did. Yeah. So when we think about it, we as believers, we do better to understand who God is. Yes. Before we talk about who God is to us. Or excuse me, what he has done for us. Not that you could know either of these things apart from each other. But one comes first. Hebrews tells us that without faith, what? It is impossible to please God. But those who come to him must first believe that what? He exists. That he is God. And he is God alone. So then when God addressed the Israelites, he told them from the jump, I am the Lord, your God. So then he told them, I am your master. All right, then, come on. And I am your God. I alone give the directions on how you worship, who you worship, how you love, who you love. And you submit to my authority. He is God and God alone. So, whether we would agree with God about how great he is, because some people don't believe God is great. Some people don't believe that God is good. Some people don't believe that God exists. But whether we agree or not with God and all the things that he says he is, we must submit to the fact that God is God alone. Come on, amen. Come on. There is no other God besides him. We must acknowledge that he is the great, eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God. And there is no other once we have established who God is and that he is our master and that he is sovereign, he rules and reigns over all people for all time, throughout all eternity. Now, we can talk about how good God is because you need to know the God you love and you need to love the God you know. They go hand in hand. You can't know him and not love him. And you can't love him and not know him. They come hand in hand. So now we talk about how good God is. Now, after God established who he was, then he says, I am the God that brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of the land of bondage. Just the same way God brought them out of captivity, God has brought us out of captivity to sin, out of slavery to sin, to, to drugs, to alcohol, to pornography, to lust, to uh, adultery, to idolatry, to all sorts of wicked things that kept us estranged from God. And matter of fact, even worse than estranged, we were enemies of God. But in due time, Christ died for the what? Ungodly. Yes. So now we can talk about what he did for us. God, for many of us, we know God to be a healer. Not only has he healed the sicknesses in our body, but he also healed all of our soul's diseases. Yes. 
Some of us know God as a provider. Because when we didn't see no way, God what? Made, made it. Made it. We just sang the song. You made a way. When my back was against the wall, and it looks as if it was over, what happened? You, yes. my God, the yes. great deliverer, yes. he did it again. Yes. And again. Yes. And again. Yes. And again. Yes. He made a way. Yes, he did. And he killed them. Others know God as our protector. Riding up and down the road. We just talked about how God was a protector for, for Matthew. And he even recognized, that even in the state that he's in, he still recognized that God, even though I am not worthy, God is still my protector. Hallelujah. He kept me from seen and what? Unseen danger. That's my God. That's the God who is my master. He is my Lord and my God. How dare we serve any other God? How dare we put anything in front of that God who declared me as his? He said I belong to him when nobody else ain't want me. He said you are mine. I will be your God and you will be my child. Yes. He owned me when everyone else disowned me. Come on. Come on. Yes. But saints, do we run to everything else? Jesus said, in me you will have peace. Yes. Jesus said, I am what? The Prince of Peace. Yes, he is. The God of all comfort. Amen. But then we run to food for comfort. What do they call it? Comfort food. That's God. When we run to that, that certain place we love to go, and mind you, ain't nothing wrong with going, you know, going a little vacation, have a little vacation spot. That's fine. Some people like to go to the beach and just sit out and look at the water. I love to do that. That's fine. Understand that the waves of that water, as beautiful as it is, it is only a creation of the omnipotent God that that thing doesn't bring me peace. He does. Amen. That place does not bring me peace. He does. That person that you swore, how many times have we done it? We swore we couldn't live without this or that person, and then years and years later we done got married and said, well, golly, I guess I'm living without him. Because that person wasn't who was for me. God gave me who was for me, but yet, even in God giving me who was for me, it was him that I needed all the time. There is nobody. nobody. There ain't nothing. nothing. And there certainly ain't no place that can take God's place. Nothing that God created and nothing created by the hands of me can or should take God's place. God is God alone. Amen. We also must keep ourselves from idols. We must keep ourselves from the organizations. We keep ourselves from these places, these things, these oaths we take. We keep ourselves from these idols. Because when we come and we submit to Christ's authority and we say that he is our God and he is our Lord, then we call ourselves what? Christians. Yeah. But when you go and join these organizations, when you go and join these fraternities or these sororities or the, the Masons or the Easter Stars, when you go join these places, then you call yourself a what? A Mason. You call yourself a Eastern Star. You call yourself a Q or, or a Delta or a Cap or whatever. You call yourself these things. You have not identified with God anymore, you have now identified with the gods of these organizations. And trust and believe, they call themselves the divine nine for a reason. When we start using the word divine, the word divine means God. When we use the word divine, capital D, 
When we use the word divine or divinity, we're talking about God. God. So then if this group of fraternities and sororities are called the divine nine, they're saying that they come from God. But what God? Because each one of them have a, a Greek or an Egyptian God that is the, the, the symbol for their fraternity. So then we're not talking about Jesus Christ. They will quote the Bible and a lot of their stuff, and then they'll take God's name out and replace it with the organization. That is demonic. That is the devil's work. That is not God. People are going to be mad. People don't like it. But it is the truth. You cannot serve. You cannot serve two masters. You're either going to love one, and you're going to hate the other. But you must choose for yourself today who you will serve. And I have chosen that God and God alone will be my Lord and my God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Verses 4 through 6. I'm almost done. We keep ourselves from practicing idolatry by obedience to God. Verse 4 says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So... Here's a quote, and I don't know who said it, but it fits perfectly here. Where our captain bids us go, tis not ours to murmur no. He that gives the sword and shield chooses to the battlefield where we are to fight the foe. All of these things are in the hands of God and God alone. Yeah. In these few verses, God demands complete devotion. Nothing created by the hands of men and nothing that God created, period, can or should take his place. God said that there would be a great fallout from this if we did it. He said that the sins of the father would be visited upon the third and fourth generation. Now, we must understand what he meant by that. What he did not mean, what he did not mean was that the, the sons or the children would be responsible for the father's sin. That was not what he was saying. What he was saying is that when a wicked man leaves a family, when a wicked man starts a family, when an evil man starts a family and plants evil seeds in his children, it's going to take generation after generation after generation to correct the order. So when you start off wrong, it's going to take generation after generation to turn it around. But then, just as far reaching is the mercy of God, that if you start off right, he didn't say you had to be perfect, but he said if you just follow me, if you do what I say, if you let me be your God, if you follow me, if you keep my commands, then I will show mercy to you generation after generation after generation after generation. When you put in good, you shall reap what you sow. But if you put in evil, you shall reap what you sow. You have sown the wind, and you have reaped what? The whirlwind. You put a little seed in the, in the ground. A great big old tree comes back out of it that keeps producing fruit. So when you put evil in, that tree is going to grow and it's going to keep producing fruit generation after generation after generation. But when you put good in, when you put Jesus in, when you keep the commandments of God, when you do what he says, when you let God lead you and you let him lead and you lead your family in the ways of God, then you put good in the soil and that tree is going to grow and generation after generation after generation the fruit will be beautiful. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Jesus said, if you love me, 
You will what? Keep, Keep my commandments. Don't get it twisted. This will not. Don't get it twisted. That your perfect ability to keep God's commandments shows your love for him. Because by that measure, we all fail miserably. By that same measure, Christ did it perfectly. Christ exceeded the, the, the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes. But how we should understand that text is because we love him, we will keep his commandments. We only love God because what? He first loved us. And because he showed his love to us and he showed his grace to us because salvation is a gift of God by grace alone, through faith alone. So when God shed his grace upon us that we wouldn't even be able to believe his truth, then once we believe his truth and we say, oh Lord, I've been wrong all this time. Now because you have shown so great love. How great was the love of God? His love was so great that it said, no greater love hath any man than this, than a man would lay down his life for what? His friend. That's the great love of God. So then when he shows that love to us, we respond to his love by what? Obedience. By doing what he said. His word said, do this, then I'm going to do everything I know how to do to do that. But that doesn't, again, put me in right standing with God. What puts me in right standing with God is that Jesus lived the perfect life. Jesus followed his father's law, followed his father's uh, commands and decrees to the fullest. He fulfilled the law, and therefore my faith in him imputes me with his righteousness, meaning that because Christ is righteous and I believe in him, his righteousness is given over to me. So when God looks at me, because of my faith in his son, I'm seen as righteous because his son is righteous, not because I am actually righteous. We are justified, meaning declared righteous in the sight of God. We are declared righteous, not that we are righteous. Jesus Christ declares us they are righteous because I am righteous and their faith is in me. And that faith that they have has been given to them by me. So then salvation is by God. And God alone. Our obedience is produced by our love for him. And so church, let us keep ourselves from idols. Let us have no other gods before him, over against him, or in his presence. God demands and deserves all of our glory, all of our love, all of our devotion. He deserves it. It belongs to him. Finally, in 1992, a group of comic book creators created what is now known as Image Comics. And they created some of the greatest comics I love. And the reason they created Image Comics is because they were all working for Marvel and DC, which y'all probably know Marvel and DC. They were working for Marvel and DC, and they were creating these wonderful characters. Gambit from X-Men, that was created by Jim Lee. Deadpool. Everybody know Deadpool? Oh, yeah. He was created by Rob Liefeld. So was Cable. So was a, a bunch of other artists. Uh, Todd McFarlane created Venom. Y'all know Venom from Spider-Man. Todd McFarlane created him. But they didn't get any of the credit for it. Marvel owns these titles. Marvel owns these characters. And Marvel, to this very day, reaps the benefit from all the characters that they created. So then they left and, got, and made their own a uh, uh, comic book company where the, the, the creators would own their books, whatever they made, they were, it was owned by them 
so they would get credit for, for the rest of their life. Just like they didn't want to give up their credit for what they created because it rightfully belongs to them, neither does God want to give up what is rightfully belonging to him. He deserves the worship from his creation. He deserves the glory from his creation. He deserves the love and the honor and the adoration from his creation. Let us keep ourselves from idols. Amen. I'm done. That's it. That's it.